do you think you see? A woman. What do you think you see? A man? What, what do, do you, you think, think you, you see? see? Imagine that you are in Athens in the year 416 before Christ. We are at the house of Agathon, a classical tragedian. And also present is Socrates, a philosopher, and Aristophanes, a playwright, and Idikimakis, a physician. We are there together in a Greek symposium, something like a seminar we're having here today. And the host, Agathon, is inviting his guests to, each in their turn, make a speech in praise of love. Now, Erikimakos has finished his speech, and now it's the turn of Aristophanes to tell his story. And as he steps forward, he relates an ancient legend about the earliest being and how that being lost its power and its heart. This being was actually comprised of the components of two people. It was not male, it was not female, but it was of one of three types. The first type, this early being, had its half being male and its other half being female. The second type, the being had its half male and the other half male. And the third type, the being had its half female and the other half female. And everyone was happy and did not give it much thought. This earliest being was an interesting creature for it was round like a circle. It had four hands, four feet, it had one head, with two faces looking in opposite directions. It could move forward and bounce around and cartwheel to great heights. This earliest being was very powerful, for because it was so connected with the components of the two people, it had a big heart, it was agile, and it could think of great things. And one day, this earliest being scaled the heights to the heavens and came face to face with Zeus and his gods. Zeus was furious. How dare that this being come into my realms? I will take my bolts from the heavens and I will destroy this being. But then he thought, well, that doesn't make too much sense because I will lo lose its sacrifices. So he devised an interesting plan. Me have a plan to humble their pride and to improve their manners. Human beings may continue to exist, but I will cut them in half so as to diminish their strength and increase their number, which is very profitable uh, to us, the gods. So Zeus took his knife and cut the three early beings right down the middle. And as from that day, the world consisted of only male and female beings of lesser strength and a less good heart. And the result also being that human beings spend the rest of their life looking for their missing half. So, how do we sit here today? Are we whole? Are we halved? Or have we halved our halves? Have we taken the labels to ourselves and to others and diminished our strength? Have we applied stereotypes to others so they cannot come into their strength? Have we invited in talent by excluding other talent? When we reflect on the story 
of Zeus and the gods, we may think it is an ancient fairy tale, but indeed, it is the reality of today, the reality of divided diversity. And I shall ask Dirk now to give an example of this in the profession of economists. This is a story about economists talking to one another about one another. One would think that economists would collaborate, unite, to become better professionals. Regrettably, in this case, no. Dr. Wu analyzed one million posts on an anonymous message board that was part of a platform with job opportunities for economists. And she tried to find out what were the words in those posts associated with female and male subjects. The result is astonishing. Male subjects are associated with words like professional, opportunity. Female subjects are associated with words that relate to demographics, age, but even physical aspects. And these are economists talking to each other about their colleagues. It seems to me that by doing so, these economists are like Zeus. They are cutting down their profession right down the middle, and they will lose a lot of professional impact. So we need to reflect, what does diversity mean for you? Is diversity the way that we look at unique talent? And then try to cut up that talent in terms of demographics, whether it's race, ethnic group, age, gender? Or is it perhaps the way that we feel compelled to measure the metrics of diversity? What percentage do we have of this person and that person in our company? And the way that we look at quotas? Or is diversity the way that we try to make it seem like it's whole by the window dressing that we bring to bear? If we have said yes to one of those questions, it means that we do live in the world of divided diversity. And Dirk will now share a story of divided diversity in sport. This is about sports. You may know Caster Semenya, a female South African track athlete, who, by the way, won the gold medal in the Olympics. You may maybe not remember that fact about her. You may remember something else, that she was asked to stop competing unless she would take testosterone squashing treatments. Semenya just happened to have extremely high levels of testosterone in her body. So Dirk, what happens to male athletes with very high levels of testosterone? Well, male athletes with very high levels of testosterone are just allowed naturally to continue competing. Even stronger, males with low testosterone levels are allowed to take testosterone supplements to increase their performance without that being considered doping. So let's get this. So you're saying, Dirk, that high testosterone women athletes are downgraded and low testosterone male athletes are upgraded? That's exactly the case, Kay. So this is a Zoys type action, but not by Zoys, but by human beings trying to maintain the segregation of genders within sport on the platform of so-called fair competition? So, Kay, do we have some people who stand up against this systems of gender division? Yes, and a definitive yes. There are many heroes and heroines that are taking a stand, and certainly in my profession, I see more and more people saying, I shall not be boxed, I will be myself. And so I relate the story of someone called Ara Halstead, and her uh, story was reported in the New York Times about a month ago. 
Ara Halstead is what we call gender fluid. It means that her gender fluctuates amongst identities. There are certain periods in her life and days where she feels very feminine, on other days that she feels very, very masculine, and other days that she sort of floats a little bit in the middle, much like the early beings that we spoke about. Ara faced stiff social resistance, for she could not be boxed and did not want to be boxed. And she went through school, and there came the day of her prom dance. Now, as you will know, the prom is an institution that categorized boys into boys and girls into girls, men into men, women into women. And she decided to, do, to go to the prom as herself. And on that day, she went to the prom dressed as a boy, a man. And she described the elation, the sense of victory for having gone to the prom as herself and having made the choice for herself. Courageous choice. Kay and I have been collaborating for many years and our collaboration has felt like the coming together of two professional halves. And what it has done to us, it has made us stronger, a lot more agile and more positive at heart. A little bit like the early being that integrates all talents naturally so as to reach much higher cliffs. Dirk, should we relate the form of our collaboration? Yes, so we've been working together a lot with team leaders of very diverse teams, guiding them towards higher levels of performance, and that by applying united diversity, or as mentors, very passionate about the development of personal, individual talent, you kind of show them the model of united diversity. And if I may add, having heard the stories this morning in terms of adaptation, in terms of confidence and what it takes to face fear, collaborating professionally on, under the principles of united diversity simply allows you to be a better human being. For one is not afraid to take one's role and to take the step to be a force of good. So, okay, what does, it, what does the world of United Diversity really look like? So, United Diversity is the state where the unique skills and capabilities of talent is merged seamlessly to deliver great performance, wellness, happiness, it is the state where there is no gender exclusion on the basis of unconscious bias, on stereotypes, but where women support men and men support women, not because there's a legal requirement or a moral requirement, but there is a deep feeling here that without supporting the other, one denies one's whole full potential. That is united diversity. Wow, so now let's move to organizations. Shall we share the five characteristics of organizations that have been highly successful in putting United Diversity at work in their companies? So let me describe that. I mean, organizations are comprised of people, of us, you. And so what I will do is describe these characteristics in terms of what one can do. So firstly, one has a shared purpose. For research has highlighted that those organizations and individuals that connect diverse talent around a shared, a spouse, passionate purpose are much, much better able to create the bedding for collaboration and great performance. Secondly, one has to dispel systematically myths and stereotypes. Research clearly shows that talent develops a lot better in organizations that have managed out stereotypes. Thirdly, one has internalized the benefits of United Diversity. And so let's be clear what this means. It means that one consistently and personally affirms one's beliefs 
of united diversity and practices them. Fourthly, you create a very safe haven for experimentation with the aim of developing more insights. So teams rethink the way they interact and they ask themselves the question they want to see, develop more understanding of what is it? What does it mean to be united whilst maintaining the diversity? And fifthly, one celebrates united diversity and this specifically means that at every dismantling of a stereotype, every dismantling of a bias that might have existed, that one celebrates that fact and acknowledges that it has passed. So we stand here in a very beautiful environment and uh, Dirk, perhaps you can talk about an example of United Diversity. We are here today in INSEAD, uh, a school where students are being trained to become global business leaders. Women and men come from all over the world, from more than 80 countries, and none of them represents more than 10% of the student population. And what the students do is they work together, they dream together, they experiment together, they travel together, and they party together. And what in fact happens in your core teams is that on a full year basis you experiment with united diversity. And they typically tell us when they leave the school, this seamless diversity of the teams has changed my life. So, I invite you now to fast forward from that day in Athens in 416 before Christ to here to now in this seminar. For we have a number of wishes for you. We'd like you to, we invite you to reclaim your earlier being consisting of two halves, whatever these halves may be. We invite you to have the feeling of agility and power and being a force of good by being whole and to be searching and looking for your professional whole and your life whole. And we invite you to be leaders of united diversity. So what do you think you see now? A woman? So, what do you think you see now? A man? You, you see, see United, United Diversity, Diversity in, in action. action. Thank, Thank you. you.